Where are we here? Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. My name is Shane Moss. Um, how many of you uh, listen to the Here We Are podcast? I'll raise your hand. We do. Let's. Uh, all right. Um, that's not bad. Like 15 of you. The majority of you don't listen. You're first timers. This is wonderful. I like making new fans. Um, how many of you have no idea who I am? Many of you. Awesome. This is wonderful. Um, uh, well, thank you guys for coming out. So I'm uh, I'm a stand-up comedian. I've been a stand-up comedian for 13 years. Um, about three years ago, I started doing this podcast. Um, in, in my tra I travel all around the country um, and, and world usually. Uh, and in my travels, I uh, look up professors and scientists in, in town to interview them about their work and why we behave the way that we do. And I try to talk about kind of big, interesting ideas in a fun, accessible uh, way, and and uh, going into this year, I'm, I'm planning on doing a lot more live ones. This is kind of new, this is only the third live one. We've done about 110 episodes, had a five-star rating on iTunes, and we now have about 50,000 listeners. So, um, uh, anyway, today's episode, I have a, uh, I have a two, uh, two professors from, um, from the university in town here, and we're going to be talking about self-control and, and kind of the, the premise of the, uh, the topic for this episode is New Year's resolutions. So first off, I was curious, how many of you raise, raise your hands to have New Year's resolutions, made New Year's resolutions? How many of you? Um, <laughs> really? <laughs> There's like three of you? <laughs> That made New Year's resolutions? Uh, all right, how, how many of you... Uh, did, wow! <laughs> well, good for you guys. Um, this is... Uh, you don't fall for that dumb social conditioning stuff. Who needs it? You don't play by the rules. Um, uh, is anyone sticking with their... Out of the three, is anyone still sticking with their... Resolution? No, zero of you, and that's not why the rest of you didn't make a New Year's resolution. You, you are. What's your What's your New Year's resolution? I'm still working on that part. <laughs> okay. But I don't so, know what it is. All right. Um, so that's a no. Um, well, my New Year's resolution was to uh, was to do this podcast live more often, and I already have uh, this and several other shows lined up, so I'm killing it. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, <laughs> this is going to be an interesting show, and I, I actually I think a lot of you guys are going to be validated <laughs> um, in your decision to not make resolutions. But uh, all will be explained. Uh, why don't you welcome the guests? For today, from the University of Minnesota, we have two professors, Kathleen Voss and Colin DeYoung. Uh, so <laughs> All right, well, um, thank you guys. Uh, so can, can you, uh, before we get into the topic specifically, uh, Colin, can you tell everybody just a little bit about what you do. Sure. Uh, I am a personality psychologist, and uh, that means I try to understand what makes people tick, and I'm interested in the way people are different from each other, and uh, why people are different from each other. And one of the things that I got into a while ago now is neuroscience, so I'm actually really interested in what are the ways in which people's brains are different uh, that makes them behave in different ways and experience the world in different ways. And Kathleen, can you give a little summary of uh, uh, your work? Certainly. I study self-control and the features of our daily lives and the 
things we do on a regular basis, not necessarily part of our personality, but things that the situation sort of makes us do, that has the consequence of wearing down our self-control. So I study why people overeat, overdrink, say the wrong thing, behave in a sexual manner when they shouldn't, um, and get into all kinds of interesting trouble. Uh, it, I'm pretty perfect, but uh, for everybody else, I imagine that would be useful information. Um, I, um, uh, um, so, so Colin talks a lot about something that in our, in our uh, podcast we've been touching on for the last year, um, these different personality traits. Can you, can you talk about, do you mostly work with what would be called the big five? The big five. Uh, <laughs> yeah, do you do. call it that? Yeah, so the big five are sort of at this point the most well established way for understanding what are the most important uh, personality traits, the most important ways that people differ from each other. So, can you just break down what the personality traits are? For Absolutely. Uh, so, we've got uh, first extroversion. Everybody's probably familiar with that idea. Some people are extroverts, some people are introverts. Um, extroverts are talkative and outgoing and assertive and enthusiastic and interestingly they even experience more positive emotions in life so you know sorry introverts uh, but on the other hand now see some people think that introverts means that you're really uh, lost in fantasy and in your own inner world but the modern meaning of that term for scientists is that you are just a little bit quieter more reserved uh, you're more content just doing things uh, on your own or with a small group of people rather than a bunch of people. Less interested in just the excitement and kind of uh, stimulation more generally. Um, second one would be neuroticism. Now that sounds bad and very Freudian. Uh, you could also just think of it as uh, negative emotion, right? So some people are more likely to experience anxiety, depression, irritability. Uh, insecurity. The bad news is if you tend to experience one negative emotion, uh, you tend to experience all of them. So that's a kind of sad fact that we've learned. As it psychology. doesn't happen with positive emotions. Does it? Uh, actually, to some extent it does. So people really? who experience some positive emotions tend to experience others too, and those are generally the extroverts, very annoying. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, neurotic, so some people are more neurotic, some people are less neurotic. That basically just means that some people are more prone to experiencing negative emotions and experiencing things as threatening than others. Uh, it, is it okay if I just say that science has determined that extroverts are annoying and we can just be fun with that? <laughs> they certainly can be. <laughs> Yeah, They're also funny. better on stage, though. Yeah. So. I, I, I'm an extrovert on stage, but I prefer to keep it to myself. Well, that's a skill that you learn. It doesn't necessarily reflect your personality. Right, right. Um, so then there's... Okay, so uh, after extroversion and neuroticism, we also have uh, agreeableness, uh, which basically reflects whether you are a jerk or not. So if you are a jerk, you're low in agreeableness, you're antagonistic, you tend to... Uh, be willing to exploit other people, to be more selfish, to be out for yourself. Uh, if you are high in agreeableness, then you're more altruistic, you're more cooperative, uh, you're more likely to try to take other people's needs and feelings into account uh, when you're figuring out what to do in life. Uh, what, 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 well, what, if, what, if you, what if you care about people, but you just think most people are full of shit? <laughs> like, can't you still, like, you're you know. probably intermediate in agreeableness. <laughs> I mean, that's probably a reasonable position, right? But yeah, if you were so. really high in agreeableness, you'd give them the benefit of the doubt. Right, right, right. I've got a bunch of cynics up here, too. <laughs> um, uh, I don't score particularly high in agreeableness. Yes, I know. <laughs> I know. Kathleen, you'd be high? No, no, no. No, no. no. That's why I'm disagreeing. I don't know you very well. No, no, no. No. I think most academics and scientists have a moderate to high degree of skepticism and disagreeableness because in part it's kind of our job we have to say well but is that the whole story and that's how we do our science yeah. someone who's really agreeable can often be unwilling to agree with to disagree with other people so you know that wouldn't work for a scientist would it right uh, okay so the fourth trait is conscientiousness um people who are high in conscientiousness 
are, uh, well, they have more self-control, uh, they, they work harder on things, they're more oriented toward achieving their goals, they're more organized, more orderly, they start things on time, like comedy shows. <laughs> hey. Hey. My mom he, came here tonight. He already told me he scores low in conscientiousness. Yeah, it's, it's, my, it's my lowest trick. I'm cheating. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then the uh, fifth trait is called uh, openness to experience, sometimes also called intellect. Those turn out to be kind of two sides of the same coin that. Uh, there are pe these are people who are basically more or less curious about the world, more or less imaginative, right? So if you're high in this trait, uh, you're probably here because you're listening to a podcast that's like a mixture of comedy and science. I don't know how many people who are low in openness are actually going to be interested in that at all. Uh, but, uh, so if you're high in openness, you're imaginative, you're more interested in art, you're more interested in philosophy and ideas. If you're low, you're more conventional. Uh, you might think that art is a waste of time. You might think that science is a bunch of dangerous nonsense. Um, you know, and then you can be somewhere in the middle and just be sort of like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so there you go. Who here thinks science is dangerous nonsense? Does anyone think that's a little higher in openness then? So that's a quick survey. So we're all a little higher. All right. Uh, there's one guy over there. D dangerous? Yeah? I just have a question. Oh, you just have a question. Like, it's dangerous. Yeah, yeah, sure. Can I ask you? Yeah, yeah. Is there, so, one, is there a way to test besides, you know, like personal experience, which personality trait you fit into? Is okay. there, he asked, is there, is there a way to test these traits? And then two, is there a way yeah, to He has potentially seven questions. <laughs> Is there a way to find a positive balance between all these traits? This is, I'm learning a lesson about bringing a wireless microphone next time I do a live podcast, so um, <laughs> I don't have to approve that. Uh, should, I, should I feel that? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, first of all, one thing that's really important is that it's not like you just fit into one of those five and that's who you are. We need all five of those things to describe everyone. So basically, uh, each of you is a profile with some level of each one of the, those traits. You're a certain amount of extroverted versus introverted. You're a certain amount of neurotic versus emotionally stable, et cetera, right? So uh, it's not like everybody's one type or another. It's like we use those to describe everyone. Um, and there are measures of that. Yeah, we have questionnaire measures generally that we give to people. Um, if we want to get an even better measurement, we give a questionnaire to your friends as well as you, because you might not always tell us the truth. Uh, and so from those questionnaires, we can get a score, and you know, we can use those to predict various things about you know, your life and what's going to happen to you. And, uh, in terms of finding a balance, uh, there tend to be, uh, you know, there, as you sort of pointed out, there's one side of these things that usually sounds better than the other. Uh, but often that there are kind of pros and cons to being at one end or the other, right? So just to give you an example, uh, you might think, well, extroverts experience more positive emotion, they're more outgoing, that sounds like a good thing, um, but they're also more likely to get into accidents. And so there's a, one of my favorite studies that gave personality questionnaires to people in hospital emergency rooms. Guess what? They score higher than average on extroversion, right? So, you know, not only are we annoying, we can do a lot of dumb yeah. shit. Yeah. So, yeah, not, not only are the new extroverts look like jackasses, they actually are jackasses. But we have more fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you need high consciousness to balance that out. That's a positive balance. Yeah, and, and uh, these... <laughs> I mean, we also kind of wear many hats, too, right? Like, um, um, we all have, I have a different personality on stage right now than I have when I'm around my grandmother or with my girlfriend, the, or uh, if I'm talking with a lawyer or something like that about some, you know, I've, we're all, these are, these are things that can shift pretty quickly, right? 
Yeah, right, so you kind of adjust your behavior to the situation that you're in, and that's kind of your territory, isn't it? Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. And so it's also important to remember that when we talk about personality traits, we're not talking about something that's fixed like all the time. If you say like, oh, that guy's an anxious guy, you don't mean he's experiencing anxiety 24 hours a day every day. You mean that he's more likely than other people to experience anxiety and to experience it more intensely. So it's important to remember that these are kind of like probabilistic descriptions, right? If I say you're an extrovert, you're not running your mouth off every second of the day, I hope. <laughs> but, um, right? and you know, when you're with your grandmother, it might manifest differently than when you're on stage. Right. So uh, it, these things are sensitive to context, yeah. Um, and Kathleen, can you talk, oh, first off, do, you, do either of you guys, did either of you make a New Year's resolution? Never have, never will. Uh, <laughs> I make just like fun goals for myself, like I'm, I just like, I'm gonna, yeah. this year I'm gonna do um, more, I'm gonna do mushrooms and sensory deprivation things more often. <laughs> 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 I had the same resolution. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to succeed, uh, and it is a challenge. Well, it's, who, who would hear the idea of doing mushrooms um, in a sensory deprivation tank makes you nervous? Raise your hand. <laughs> See, I'm a very brave person, if you ask me. Um, responsible. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Kathleen, can you talk a little bit um, about, uh, so, so let's, uh, what does your research say about something like New Year's resolutions and how, how successful are they for your average person? <laughs> well, apparently those in attendance today are not your average bear, but most people do, or at least say that they do, um, set New Year's resolutions. It may be one, but it tends to be usually a, a menu of things that people want to change about themselves and they take the calendar year flipping over as a reason to start thinking about these ways they should improve themselves. The problem with this approach, according to the work that I have done for the last 15 years, is that most of the time people take on too many resolutions. In other words, too many goals. I am all for setting goals, and it's a big part of why I'm a self-control researcher, and I think how I've gotten to where I am today, but when people take on a lot of big initiatives, and they tend to be things like, I'm gonna lose weight, I'm gonna run a marathon, I'm gonna be nicer to my spouse. These are, these are big things, uh, <laughs> some bigger than others. Uh, they often are ill-defined, so for example, I wanna get healthy in 2017. It was really a very amorphous type of goal that's just likely to lead to a lot of uh, spin-outs and um, sort of psychological spin-outs. It's difficult to know what to do to be healthy. But we are going to make America great again. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's very specific. <laughs> All you need is a wall. <laughs> loftier goals than others, yes, yes. And so the research that my colleagues and I do um, essentially points to this uh, idea that when people take on very lofty goals, especially if they're vague, and in, in particular when they take on many goals, they're likely to fail at all of them because people only have so much energy to devote to pursuing their goals. And when they're trying to do too much all at once, the, the psychological system gets overwhelmed and people are less likely to be able to achieve any of them. I mean, I think this is, we need to start teaching this to children. Set as few of goals as <laughs> <laughs> um, Might not be a bad idea. Kids are bad at self-control. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, so what are some of the other roadblocks that people run into when uh, trying to achieve these lofty goals? <laughs> or, or even, so, so you want to have more specific measurable goals, right? Yeah. Yep, you can say I want to lose 10 pounds, and then you have to know how much you weigh now, and then from that you can calculate how much you would like to weigh ideally, and then you have at least some measurable um, pathway to success. Uh, so. 
too lofty goals, vague goals, and taking on too many goals are um, some of the ingredients to like losing self-control on a continual basis. Because then what happens is, is that we all have other activities in our lives that we're trying to manage in one way or another. Maybe you end up doing too much you know, Amazon priming and buying too many things online, or maybe you already have a tendency to skip the gym. All of those um, tendencies and biases are gonna come to the fore when you're using your self-control energy in order to try for these new goals. So um, when I when I have some time off and, and I'm in LA, I I'm so I, like most people, um, I, I who who in here can just exercise on like a regular basis? By the way, and like you just knock it out of the park and <laughs> love it. And just, yeah. Okay. And so so that that's that's like probably probably ten. So ten percent of you, maybe. Or, Here it depends well, on the season. Uh, that was yeah, yeah. Summer, yes, winter. Well, I, I envy you guys, and and I mean I've been in those routines before, and like once you're in the routine, it definitely does, and it, and, and there's a lot of positive endorphins and everything else. But when I'm um, when I'm in LA and I have some time off, it's definitely much easier to get myself to like a rock gym or you know whatever, or, or go for a swim and. And now I'm, I'm in the middle of a, um, what's going to be a 100 city tour when everything's said and done and I'm driving to like a new city almost every day. And now I'm like, I, because I'm run down, all of a sudden yeah. all, I'm picking up all of these bad habits, and <laughs> smoking more, drinking more, every, everything else is, uh, things just start kind of falling apart as yeah. I'm just more physically fatigued. Yes, yeah, physical fatigue and psychological fatigue, and they tend to go hand in hand. And and the work that we've been doing in my lab for the past like five, ten years is really pointing to even making decisions as being a drain on your ability to make good decisions in the future, like meaning like later that day, and also being able to use self control in a wise and um, helpful manner. This has been uh, a new insight for us, that even making decisions. So I think that when you are driving to a new place and you're like, where's the hotel and right? And you have a lot of decisions to make. Where am I gonna eat? I don't know this area. Yeah, I don't have to make that many decisions actually. <laughs> like, I, I kind of have myself on autopilot okay. now. But I mean, when, when I book it, I certainly did. I, I mean, I, I, I'm a little bit on autopilot. It's just like the sheer amount of hours that I have to be yeah. awake and concentrating. Like, um, uh, uh, what, what would you say um, is the role of, of sleep and and <laughs> ego? Huge, <laughs> right? Well, I don't know. Uh, I did an experiment a few years ago where we kept people up for 24 hours with a chaperone, which is super legit because a lot of times if you read sleep studies. Not that anyone in here necessarily does, but they tend to ask people how much sleep they had the night before. And it turns out we're all fairly poor at knowing how many hours of sleep we got and sleep quality. And so we kept people up for 24 hours with a chaperone and then some other subjects got to go to sleep and then we tested them all on these uh, ego fatigue ideas. And it wasn't really the amount of sleep that mattered. It was really how much we'd made them use self-control just um, earlier in the session. And that kind of speaks to the heart of our model, which is using self-control has an ironic effect of making you less good at <laughs> achieving self-control right immediately thereafter. I'm not saying that's the end story on sleep, but in the, in the scientific work that we've done, we think sleep is less important, although what we find is that people tend to like to blame sleep or a lack thereof on their self-control failures when maybe it's caused by something else that people are just not aware of, like how much you've been using self-control already that day. So I've just been kidding myself. Maybe. Uh, <laughs> well, that would be the first time. Well, something that people uh, might find super interesting that's related, uh, can you talk about your uh, your works in uh, how your work has influenced uh, Mark Zucker and and uh, um, uh, Barack Obama. Oh yes, I think Zuckerberg probably Zuckerberg. got it from Obama. I'm guessing. Uh, I, mean, I don't know that he got it from me, but 
somehow, somewhere, Barack Obama, uh, probably around 2010 or so, got a hold of the research that that we've been doing and this idea that using self-control and making decisions has this harmful effect on later decision making and later self-control so that it's an easily depleted resource. We think of it like a psychological resource. And so Michael Lewis, the author of Moneyball, The Big Short, etc., uh, got to spend three days with President Obama in the run-up to the 2012 election and he published a uh, a long form article about those three days in Vanity Fair. And I'm just guessing that it's because it's like the human interest part of the story. When Michael Lewis asks President Obama, have you made any changes to your personal life um, upon coming to the White House? Obama says, well, yes I have. Uh, you'll see I only wear gray and blue suits. I don't choose uh, what I'm going to eat or largely what I'm going to wear because there's research showing that people only have a limited amount of decision-making capacity, and I can't go around all day being distracted by trivia. So that was fun for, fun for me. And, uh, and then the follow-on to that is I just read an article in the New York Times. It came out um, actually just a couple weeks ago in which someone was profiling Obama once again. And apparently, uh, Obama and Rahm Emanuel, who is the mayor of Chicago and a very trusted advisor to President Obama, have a long-standing running inside joke that when they retire from public service, they want to open up a t-shirt shop in Hawaii where there's only one thing sold, white t-shirts, size medium. <laughs> and it's because, and it literally says in this article, because they don't want to make any more decisions. And so in very tough, briefing situations uh, and, and in these circumstances where they're spending hours together and things are really taxing, apparently one of them will mouth to the other white and the other one will mouth back medium. <laughs> That's how much they want to escape decision making. Uh, and, and so then Zuckerberg held a town hall meeting and said, you know, open different questions as town hall meetings go. And someone asked, why do you always wear a gray hoodie or a gray t-shirt? And he said, you know, I need to save my decision-making resources and capacity so I can best serve this community. So if you want to be better at making decisions, you want to, part of it is trying to make less decisions. Yeah, right. Uh, how, how do you, uh, what, what kind of, um, uh, what, what kind of, I don't know, guidelines or, or tips would you would give people or have you found in some of your, of your research as far as how to figure out, how do you decide which decisions are worth deciding on? <laughs> it's just, life is a very complicated thing. So. It's so meta, as my students say. Uh, we're probably used to like four years ago. Yeah, uh, I, I think, Especially with decision making, I think people don't recognize how many decisions they make. And so um, there's a very well known uh, eating scientist who actually tracked the number of decisions people made simply about food on a daily basis. And then for those same individuals, asked them to um, estimate how many decisions about food they make each and every day. People estimate they make 15 food related decisions a day, but in reality, people make about 220 food-related decisions a day. And that's because you think of things like, do I heat it up or eat it cold? Should I eat it all or eat half? Over the sink or in the car? <laughs> and if you think about food, which is like a big part of our lives, but then you spin that out ad nauseum, you know, we're making a lot of decisions, many of which are completely unnecessary. So kind of ripping off Shane here, set up a habit. Um, or like when I go to a Starbucks, I have two moves. One basic move, I have a basic coffee I like, an Americano, and one move when I'm feeling fancy, which is a soy latte. And if you can structure your decision making like that, then you probably have more resources for the important ones. I think though trying to figure out what are the important ones before, like ex ante, like, it's very difficult to do, I think, often, because we're not sure what we're going to face. Well, maybe kind of imagining our, our day ahead of time and the kind of things that, yep. the many roadblocks that you might come across, you're kind of thinking about what you're going to do and then thinking, okay, this is, yep. well, 
I'm going to have these important decisions to make, and then I'm going to go to lunch with someone, and so those are not important decisions, and, and so I won't, I'll, I'll try to spend as little time <laughs> looking at the menu as possible, you know, maybe yeah. there's things like that. that yeah, exactly, yeah, your day exactly. Bit. I think sort of from a broad brush stroke, I try to teach people, like when I talk to executives or general audiences or my wonderful students, to think about the idea that decision making and self-control is precious. It's a precious thing that it, it resides in you and use it wisely. So try to be on alert for places that you're just needlessly <laughs> spending these resources. And then ideally be on the lookout for, you know, this is a time when I really need to recruit more of those resources. But it, it is difficult uh, to know always what you're, what you're gonna be faced with. Um, well, Colin, I'll get back to you in a minute, but Kathleen and I are really hitting it off here. I'm curious, what, what, the, what is the role of uh, distractions in decision making? Do you, do you, do, or, or, or ego fatigue, uh, or whatever you yeah, what, but no, I'm I'm no my face is doing this uh, squinching up because of the distractions. What's a distraction? That's a cool idea. I don't know. Um, just uh, uh, people talk about everyone being so distracted now. <laughs> distraction. Because they have. Like, is that the seven question guy? <laughs> um, um, so so people talk about how. Kids these days are very distracted, or people are on their phones, they're distracted by their phone. Do you think that, that there could be any correlation um, with uh, that also potentially influencing people's ability to make better decisions? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, actually, this is a good question, I think, to, to, to the <laughs> full stop. And um, something that I think Colin also knows a lot about, so I think we can both address it. I mean, from my perspective, the more that you're on your, let's just call it devices instead of distractions, per se, presumably the more that you're doing things, maybe not even consciously, but like, mm, should I check Facebook one more time, or should I get back to work, or do I have time for one more, more game of Sudoku, or should I cut it off, and, and, and also you're tussling with these impulses, like you're like, I really don't want to go back to work, or I really don't want to um, address that difficult email that I should get to. And so there's a, a lot of management of feelings and emotions and, um, and impulses and decisions that take place. But I think I'm channeling other things that you and I have had um, conversations in the past. I think also when you flit around from one thing to another, you really don't train your, your, your working memory so that when you do need to focus, you don't really have the skills anymore. You've gotten all flabby. Yeah, well, practice makes perfect, right? I mean, I guess there are two things that I think about here. Uh, and one of them is that people think that they're good at multitasking, but they're not. No. Right? Uh, <laughs> yes. So psychologists have demonstrated this pretty convincingly by now. People right. vastly right. overestimate their ability to pay attention and work on multiple things at once. So just I'm, have, I'm nodding my head as you're just wah, wah, wah in my ear. <laughs> 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 What's he talking about? Yeah, okay, okay. Right. What, what are you thinking about, Shane? <laughs> <laughs> Something's got your attention, but it's not me. Damn. <laughs> right, so, uh, so you are doing yourself a disservice, basically, by having all of these things around that essentially automatically attract your attention. Right, and one way to think about it is just that you've got all these potential distractions, but another way is to think about them is that they're all things that are rewarding in different ways, uh, and some of them are a lot more immediately rewarding than others. Uh, and so one of the things that human beings are rewarded by is information, especially people who are high in openness, right? Because that means you're more curious. And so if you're the kind of person who's just sort of generally curious and high in openness, then things like uh, you know, Facebook or whatever other kind of news feed you've got going on, it's deadly, right? Because it's like, you could be working on something hard, or you could have new bits of information that you didn't know about, like cheetah kittens or whatever else that's running around on your, you know, everything fascinating and new is just right there immediately. Right, I so, mean, if you guys don't know about cheetah kittens, though, seriously. <laughs> <There's> so <cute. laughs> There's your nearest so resolution. Cute. Get to know about the cheetah kittens. <laughs> 
Uh, I thought of that because they appeared in my Facebook feed yesterday. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, well, what about uh, what about neuroticism? Did, would that have an influence on say say like I mean it's it's nice being up here talking to you guys, but I'm really wondering how many retweets my last tweet got, and I kind of want to check that out too. Do you think that that has any kind of a so their neuroticism could be a factor. The thing is. Uh, this sort of tendency toward distraction and impulsivity and getting sidetracked, that can be influenced by a number of different personality traits, right? So uh, that kind of pure curiosity I was talking about, that's kind of an openness thing. Uh, neuroticism is about like worries. So people get distracted by worries and people who are higher in neuroticism are more likely to get distracted. So if, you know, if, if you're here like, uh, did I put money in the meter? Am I going to get a ticket? You know, like, uh, that kind of thing is a way in which you can be distracted by potential threats. Uh, those are kind of neurotic distractions. Um, but then there's sort of this, uh, from a personality perspective, you might think of it as like the master trait for distractions, and that would be conscientiousness, right? It's do you have the ability, regardless of what the distractions are, to ignore them and bring yourself back to what you're supposed to be focusing on? Is conscientiousness a major player in just self-control? Is that one of the highest? Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it right. probably is the biggest factor in terms of self-control. Oh dear. Oh. <laughs> 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 so I mean, it's also a major predictor of life outcomes, right? So people who are higher in conscientiousness actually live longer than people who are lower on average. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they don't live better though, do they? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Right. No, actually, they do and live and better. And it probably feels even longer than that because how boring their lives <laughs> No, 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 no. Listen, I, I actually wrote a paper on exactly this question. We use something called trait self control, which is a very close Similar. cousin to conscientiousness. And the paper is called Yes, But Are They Happy? Because we were always giving speeches about self control and how positively beneficial it is in people's lives and and there are a lot of shame mosses in the world saying yeah but it was really boring and like very tedious and essentially we figured out that people high in conscientiousness self-control what have you um, have happier lives because they avoid difficulties stressors and problems and so yes it's fun to get into trouble every once in a while but if you do that on the regular there's a lot of times when you just don't, don't want to or can't cope with it, and that's exactly when said troubles arise. So... It's one of the costs of kicking ass, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, uh, maybe you could find some people who are really happy who somehow managed to be successful and avoid trouble despite being low in conscientiousness. Presumably. Well, they exist. I mean, I, to I, my I, 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 I get it. I've, I've, I've definitely gotten myself in all sorts of trouble in my, and, and not just like with the law or whatever, but just in, in relationships, being like a super messy person or just being exceptionally disorganized and forgetting about emails. So I gotta get back to people. And I mean, I, I every year I spend like thousands of dollars and just like forgetting to pay a thing on time or parking <laughs> tickets or just like dumb stuff that yeah, yeah. And it gets I, worse, doesn't it? It does get worse. I'll get a I'll get a parking ticket, I'll have the money to pay it, and then three months will go by and now it's four times and there's like then I get a call from a collection agency. I'm like, oh really? I didn't pay that? Oh here is four hundred dollars. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so you, you definitely pay a cost for I think conscientiousness is also why I think in general it doesn't make sense to worry about New Year's resolutions, right? Because people who are conscientious don't need to make the resolutions in the first place because they're already doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. People who are low in conscientiousness are never going to be able to follow through with those things, you know, anyway. Yeah. So why bother? Yeah, I follow through on very few things. <laughs> oh, only big things. things. I, yeah. uh, only, only the biggest, most important things I follow through on. The little things I, I, I just can't. I can't be bothered with. Um, but um, actually, at, at this point, does anyone have any any questions? We're, we're going to keep on talking to them, but I thought this would be, yeah? And there's someone in the back, too, sorry. Yeah, yeah I was just curious with the decision making, um, do you think like early childhood trauma would affect someone's ability to make decisions in adulthood? Oh, well, yes. I was wondering when we are going to talk about early childhood trauma. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> 
childhood trauma, uh, trauma uh, affects, what was it, decision making? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't do this research, but this research is very, um, very important and just becoming um, something people are starting to think about. It turns out if you have an, a, a, an adverse or a, um, especially problematic childhood event or even just childhood period, then you tend to make decisions that are much more in favor of what's good for you right here and right now, and less likely to make decisions that are helpful for people, for yourself, that is, in the long run. And that is, I mean, we haven't, we are being such bad scholars, we didn't define self-control yet, but self-control is in many ways defined as doing something that benefits you in the future, even if, or especially if, it comes at a cost to happiness or comfort right now. And so that trade-off, this short-term, long-term trade-off, is one of the hallmarks of having good self-control and having these difficult childhood situations and circumstances often then leads people to make decisions that favor the short run, and we're just figuring this out. Yeah, and we actually have some done some research on that in the context of looking at how childhood maltreatment, uh, you know, abuse or neglect or one of these other cheerful topics, uh, influences people's personality over the long run. Um, and it really has a pervasive effect on people's personality, right? It makes them uh, have higher levels of neuroticism, more prone to various psychopathologies, you know, depression, anxiety disorders, et cetera. Um, but also, you know, that's the obvious one, but it also does tend to make people lower in conscientiousness. Uh, it just, it makes people have trouble with a lot of the things that, uh, you know, make most of our lives easier, and self-control is a big thing there, yeah. And then sometimes you can just have a mom that's hyper conscientious and you look at how much she spends, how much time she spends cleaning every day and you're like, fuck it, I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, well, you know, you know I, I think the, uh, we, and we've talked about this before, actually I think we talked about it on one of the last live podcasts, um, but it's just very relevant. I think that the uh, the, the marshmallow test, uh, to me, is kind of a very easy way of explaining the childhood um, unstable environment stuff. So, it, so it used to be. I mean, you guys are welcome to Carol. Or I can present it. Sure. Um, you, you want us to do the marshmallow test? Um, <laughs> can yeah. I get two beers? Uh, <laughs> can I wait? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's just. Um, uh, so the, you you give a marshmallow to a kid, and, and then you go, hey. Don't eat this. If it's still here when I come back in the room in five minutes, you get two marshmallows. And there's a million different variations of this test, right? And then, so then they, so this is like a way of measuring self-control in, in children, and they find out that the kids that, that can wait and don't eat this marshmallow, um, actually, with this, now that I'm thinking of it, they, the, the ones that are effective at it distract themselves and think yeah, about Yeah, right. That, right? That's so that's people have studied the kind of strategies right? that little kids use yeah. to try to improve right. their own self-control. Yeah, yeah. just turn around and don't look that's at right. that damn marshmallow. <laughs> don't even think about that marshmallow. Uh, that's right, that's right, yes. And it's the ones who put it, they like put it in their hands, they put it right up to their you, mouth and they sniff it. Oh, it's, so, so bad. it's a bad strategy. <laughs> Bad. Yeah, and actually, so that's why when you said distractions, distractions are actually some of the keys uh, to self-control yeah, um, when yeah, yeah. you are faced with an immediate temptation. Mm -hmm. And so closing your eyes, little kids would sometimes with their fingers, one finger in each ear and go, oh, like they're just singing a song. Uh, there's a wonderful video, four minute video online that I often use to describe self-control to executives and, and of the children, of the, the video, children. The ch which everyone should watch. It's, it's adorable. Better and, than yeah. cheetah kittens, it is in my opinion. And you'll learn something. And you'll learn something. Well, there's a lot to learn about cheetah kittens, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's another episode entirely. Um, Wild Kingdom. <laughs> it's a five-part episode I'm doing. On so, so this this marshmallow test, they figure out that that you know they measure these kids have uh, some of them have more self control than others, and then they check back in 20, 30 years yeah. later, and these people and yeah, yeah. and these and these people that uh, that had that didn't eat the marshmallow demonstrated more self control as kids end up having doing better in school and having better jobs and staying out of trouble, and so it seemed like at the time that this was like some in. Uh, inherent 
thing, this magical gift that some people had and some people didn't. And now it's my understanding that, and, and I know this is some of your work and we're going to get into that, but, um, um, uh, but, but, uh, but it's my understanding, and, and we can, uh, you can correct me, that now the thinking is, is that what, was, what it was actually showing was it was, is in many cases, testing how unstable the home environment is. If you came from an unstable home, what, what you learned was that the world is really unreliable and you can't trust anybody, so when someone left the room and said they're gonna come back with two marshmallows, you'd be like, well, that's what my dad always says, he never comes. <laughs> no, that's, 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 that's an interpretation. I probably interpretation. Should disagree with that. There you go. Oh, good, yeah. great. Well, I mean, so I think it's partly true, right? Um, one of the interesting things that we've learned over the last, oh, I don't know, like uh, several decades is that these sort of basic personality dispositions, like you know how much self-control you have, or the big five, or however you want to frame it, um, they are substantially influenced by your genetic background, right? So there is a substantial way in which what you've inherited from uh, from your parents and your various ancestors actually does influence your personality. And you can see this partly because if you look at something like uh, just to get back to a happy topic, childhood maltreatment. Uh, <laughs> you know, so yes, of course, on average, kids who are maltreated are gonna do worse than kids who aren't, and they're gonna uh, be at more risk for various problems. Um, but some of them do really well, they're resilient, right? And they uh, actually manage to go on and lead successful lives and be reasonably happy and not have mental disorders. And that ends up having a lot to do with their personalities and the part of it that is uh, genetically transmitted. Colin just told everyone to hit their kids. <laughs> if you think you've got good genes and you want to take a look, then I guess so. <laughs> but, but no, so what I'm saying is that it's really hard to disentangle with something like the marshmallow test how much uh, that, uh, that tendency that's there already in early childhood has come from their genetic background or how much it's come from their environmental influences, right? Because the best influences, that, uh, the best estimates that we have for these things right now is that it's about 50% genetic and 50% environmental. Uh, so that's a substantial amount that's coming from your genes, but it's also a substantial amount that's coming from the things that you've experienced or even things like the amount of stress your mom experienced while you were in the womb. Uh, there are all kinds of things environmentally that can influence people's behavior as well. And sure, like what you learned from how stable or unstable your environment was. So um, your work's really interesting because I've, I've talked about these five traits a uh, number of times on the podcast. And, um, and you definitely have a uh, unique and kind of specific uh, take or, or in your research. It, you, you kind of study more of the, from a neuroscience perspective and, and the genetic effects. Can you talk a little bit about that sort of specifically? Uh, sure, um, and I guess try to do it without getting too technical, right? But, um, I mean, you're just fine. Yeah, because so <laughs> high in openness, right? Uh, very curious. I so, if, if I don't get it, um, I'll, I'll let you know. If I get it, like, well, uh, <laughs> so I guess the basic gist here is that these, these big five personality traits, that's kind of very widely established and there's lots of evidence that those are important. Um, but one of the interesting things about it is that people have established it as a really good description of people's personality, but we still don't necessarily know where they come from. So one of the things that I've always been really interested in is why do people differ in these ways? Uh, and I'm interested in the different patterns of brain activity, brain function, that lead people to have different personality traits. So just to take a, the, let's take the example of uh, extroversion and neuroticism, right? So we've got one that's about uh, how kind of, you know, excitable and uh, uh, exploration and approach oriented you are. You just start talking to any new person that you see. Um, and then with neuroticism, we've got one that's about how uh, much negative emotion you experience. Are you easily threatened and frightened and anxious and worried? Well, so there's pretty good evidence at this point uh, from uh, neuroimaging research, MRI brain scans, that kind of thing, uh, also working directly with like drugs and neurotransmitters uh, to show that extroversion really depends on the sensitivity of people's reward systems in the brain. 
Um, and similarly, neuroticism depends on the sensitivity of people's threat systems. And so these are two different systems that are operating in your brain. Uh, one of them is kind of looking out for, it's like, am I gonna be able to get the things that I want? Are there good things around me? And if there are, if you detect cues of that, then they need to motivate you to try to work to get them, right? To, to move toward them. That's fundamentally moving toward your goals, whether they're short-term goals or long-term goals. Um, but then, of course, there are also potential dangers or threats in your environment, so you have a whole brain system that's designed to uh, detect and uh, make you respond in an adaptive way to those things. And there's a lot of evidence now that those things are actually <laughs> setting these sort of more general personality parameters that anybody can see, right? Anybody can look at somebody and say, well, why is he always talking and running around being an obnoxious extrovert, right? And well, part of that is because that person uh, just experiences the world as having more potential reward. Like they look over and they're like, oh my God, I want to talk to that guy. He looks really interesting. Right? Whereas <laughs> the introvert is there like, oh, I don't know any of these people. Why would I put in the effort to you know, actually go over there? Right? Strangers just look like cookies or something. <laughs> 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 For the extrovert, a stranger's like a cookie. It's like, you know, the introvert, I know that cookie's good. The extrovert's like, that guy looks like a chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> um, uh, well, so a lot of these, a lot of these tests, and there's a, um, there's like a fun program, Apply, uh, apply um, Magic Sauce. Have you heard of it? No. no. It, it looks at your... Neither of us have ever heard yeah. of this. It was, it was, it was, <laughs> no, it's fine. No. One of my best guests is uh, Stanford. They're just the, the big five. But he, he, he put together these... Uh, Okay, well, um, <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed. I don't remember my past guest names. Applied magic sauce? So, um, he's a researcher at Stanford who uh, uh, you can you can go to, to applymagicsauce.com, I think, and and then you and then you give it access to your Facebook profile, and it takes everything that you've liked on Facebook and then develops this yeah. big five personality profile for you, and then. So you, you can all do that after the show, right? Um, and and then um, and, and so it, it was it was funny. And, and so, for example, I and develop like your your political leanings and all of these other various things. And because I have people that I have liked, just because, like, say Joel McHale, for example, who I've I've worked with a fair amount, um, and and we're friends, so I've liked his page, but I could honestly give a fuck about much of his work, um, and and it's not like I wouldn't like uh, like eat. I don't care about anything on the channel E or anything like that. But um, fine enough actor, but a super cool dude. Um, but anyway, the point is, is that, is that because I had him on there, and it will show the things that it used to evaluate you. I, I think Apply Magic Sauce said that I'm, uh, that I'm like something like ten percent gayer than the average population, <laughs> and it specifically pointed to Joel McHale. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like 20% gayer, honestly. It's just that I updated my Facebook profile. Um, but, but, so your average test is going to, say, say when you're evaluating something like, um, uh, like openness, what's, what's a question in a survey that would apply to openness? Like, like do, you, do you like new restaurants or something sure, do you like, like that? Do you like new restaurants? Do you like poetry? Do you have an active imagination? Do you avoid philosophical topics? You know, any of these things that could be relevant. So you're filling out these surveys. My question is, is um, certainly in the future, it seems to be, but how far away, or do you think that we can maybe even do some of this stuff now, can you put someone in an MRI and determine their personality? Well, that's a really good question, and it's funny because I had somebody ask me that a few years ago uh, who was a scientific colleague, uh, and he, he was doing a, he wanted to do a set of talks at a scientific conference, it's the kind of things we do for fun, um, about new ways to assess personality, and he wanted me to talk about this, like can we assess personality using brain scans? And my first impulse was to say, no, no way, not gonna happen. Um, 
there's so that we're so far from understanding exactly the the specific all the basis in the brain of these things. And then I remembered a study that I did uh, with some other people. I was only kind of peripherally involved, which is probably why I forgot it in the first place. Uh, but where we were actually looking at people's IQ and then trying to predict it based on just uh, values that came out of assessing their brains in the scanner, looking at the structure of their brain and also how their brain was functioning when they were doing a difficult cognitive task. Um, and we were actually able to predict people's IQs from their brain function with a surprising degree of accuracy. Right? We could predict it as well as we could from like another sort of short IQ test. You know, like you might go online and do an IQ test that only has like, I don't know, uh, 20 questions or something. We could predict people's full scale IQ from like the whole battery of tests that people use to measure IQ officially uh, just as well from their brains as we could from uh, that kind of short online IQ test. Uh, who, who in here, uh, does that make anyone nervous in here? Or is, uh, 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 would, would, you be, would you be nervous about going and getting an uh, MRI to really find out how dumb you are? <laughs> I'd be a little nervous. I, uh, honestly, I'd, uh, Here's why I'd think a little be. overly highly of my intelligence, probably, I imagine. Here's why you shouldn't be, because we can already do a much better job measuring your intelligence with an IQ test. Yeah. And that's a hell of a lot cheaper than putting you in an MRI scanner, which costs about five hundred dollars an hour to run. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so it's uh, okay. So, so it's but, but eventually, um, might the MRI be more accurate than the, so? So, take a personality test where someone's self-reporting, and you're handing something over to someone, and and it's like, uh, uh, are are you? Um, are, are you, say, it's asking a question like, do, do outsiders make you nervous or something like that? And someone's like, well, I don't want this person to think I'm a bigot or something. So they rate higher than they, than they normally would. So potentially, the MRI could be uh, truer. Yeah, there's definitely a potential that we could get you know, a less biased source of information from something like an MRI scan than we could from your self-reports. Mm -hmm. um, and what do you think that, um, what I was trying to say. Um, anyway, there's a question over here. That's just kind of my Yeah, yeah. Yes. There, there was. Uh, so I was wondering, since um, our capacity to make decisions is a finite resource, does that mean that the best way to live is to ration out that resource or to work it as though it's a muscle, to continue to make decisions, to get better just by making more and more decisions? Yeah, it's a question, great question. He was asking um, whether you should really think about decision making and self control as something that's precious and depletable, or as something that's um, like a muscle that you have in your body that you use it over time and you can get stronger with it. And uh, I mean, both ideas are plausible, and reasonable people will disagree, but. From the evidence that I've seen and worked on, it's just a lot easier to make something worse than to make it appreciably better. And and and, 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 and sort of a yeah, that's true for everything. Right? Of life, right? And it, I mean, and, and, you need to screw it up. Yeah, this is thermodynamics. It's, it's, <laughs> Entropy. Entropy, or uh, yes, I, I yes, I think of it like bad is stronger than good, and and it really marries off of what Colin's been working on, like. If you are born or raised or your environment or any combination of these things or any other things lead you in adulthood to have a certain style and um, general level of self-control or decision making, that's your kind of what we would call baseline. That's where you are most days, most times, most places, fine. And you can go down from that, but to get better than that, that is working the system really, really hard. I think people can do it, I've seen evidence of it, but most of us have an easier time losing self-control than getting above our natural baseline. So, and losing self-control has way more problems than just getting, a, like, let's say you get 15% better at self-control, great, that is good, but the, the key is not to lose self-control because that's where you get the biggest um, consequences for your everyday life. Well, that's well, where I come down. It might be worth saying here something that's a little more optimistic than that, which is that uh, over the course of people's lives, there are uh, sort of 
regular developmental changes in people's personality and in their levels of self-control and conscientiousness and things like that. Um, and uh, especially uh, when people sort of move through that phase of young adulthood when they tend to get a job and they get married and they have kids and they have a family, uh, there is a, a normative change for people to actually get better levels of self-control and conscientiousness. So in other words, if you set out specifically your New Year's resolution is to say, I'm gonna have more self-control this year, well, you know, good luck, buddy. But um, on the other hand, if you just happen to have gotten a really high-powered job and you got married this year, well, you don't even have to try and probably you're gonna get more self-control and more conscientious whether you like it or not just because your life is demanding that of you, right? So part of it is about how you approach it. So. Uh, if you really want to have more self-control, you should probably do things like we were talking earlier about setting goals that are concrete and relatively specific, uh, you know, and actually coming up with specific strategies to achieve them. Because just saying in general, like, I want to increase my levels of self-control, that's not likely to work. But that doesn't mean it's hopeless. Right. And, and um, uh, one, I, I think that if I'm hearing you right, I need to have a kid if I want to get my shit together. So, <laughs> it's, it's not worth it. Um, I can just pay someone else twenty thousand dollars a year to get my shit together for me. Um, if you can afford it. Um, <laughs> same as kids. Um, but but I, I think one important thing to point out is that that you can build good habits once once you have once you have have habits good or bad in your brain these become autonomic responses or automatic no, no, no. Uh, probably not little autonomic little but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but yeah auto, just, automatic it's yeah, not like yeah. it's not like breathing but <laughs> but but it but it um it, it kind of uh, cre creates kind of these shortcuts with, within your brain and, and kind of the neural networking and it increases efficiency and both, both it doesn't matter if, if, it's, if, if it's exercise or crack, it's the same sort of, both, both well, good or bad. Like a bad ideas here. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just saying in, in the way in which habits form I mean habits have form, I mean Drug addiction and great habits are, are still, they're just habits and right, they're forming true. in the same kind and of way. And that's because they become and automatic and you just do it. And so, yeah. so you can figure out how to build better habits and then once you have those better habits, you no longer have to think about them. You do them, well, maybe a little bit, but you do them like the people that raised their hands earlier that have no problem just going to the gym every day or whatever. And this is uh, this is easy, or, or it might even be distressing for you to not go to the gym every day once you once you have this uh, this good habit, and then that frees up your brain to have more energy for making other decisions. And the cool thing is that's literally true, right? So there are studies using brain scans of how people form habits, and basically when people are starting to work on some new task, some new thing that they've never done before, when they do it. Uh, all parts of their brain are active. Huge tracts of uh, neural territory are uh, engaged in doing that thing. And then as you get better at it, and you make it more habitual, and you automate it, it basically gets uh, to be a smaller and smaller amount of your brain that you need to actually do that thing. So it's almost like your brain is capable of building like this automatic little machine uh, in one small part of it that can do this thing where it used to be that it took all the resources of most of your brain to get it done. So you really are literally saving energy that your brain has to engage by making something habitual and just turning it into a habit. And the interesting thing is there's another side to this too. When we, when we talk about how, how important self-control is and how hard it is or whatever else, I mean, there, there's also people can have too much routine and never go out and have new experiences and increase their mental flexibility and the brain will actually atrophy uh, because and, and that will that will lead to more mental health problems alzheimer's etc um and if you i i mean just just show so if you take a elderly person who's who's um uh 
suffering from some mental degeneration, like we all will if we're lucky enough uh, to live that long. That's what we get. Um, and, uh, that's, then uh, there's simple things like you can take off someone's shoes and have them walking around, and just and just the 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 nerves, the senses from their bare feet activating the brain a little bit more, just lights it up a little more uh, than normal. And so the, there's also increasing flexibility. And, and when you talk about something like self-control, I mean, I think, I think some people are so obsessed with self-control that they miss a lot of opportunities and they're so risk averse and uh, they need to hold on to like this, uh, these routines of theirs and they don't. And I think some people need to go out and and get a little reckless once in a while and have an adventure. Well, right, but that's why we wrote that paper. Yes, but are they happy? But usually those things... No, but I'm talking about like for mental health. No, I know, yeah, but... No, even for mental health, I was going to bring that up, right? Because, uh, you know, at the, at the beginning of this, we started talking about whether there were kind of pros and cons to these different personality traits. If you have too much conscientiousness, that actually is a risk for having certain compulsive problems, right? Where it's like you're too rigid, you're too perfectionistic, you're too attached to things, and that can itself prevent you from actually getting things done. We're gonna disagree on this. Um, <laughs> Seriously, unfortunately, we, I mean, I would love to go into this why. This is get good, everybody. This is, this is what I don't tell them when I reach out to scientists, what I don't tell them, and what we all know, theory <laughs> on it, is that this whole thing was just to get these two to fight it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure in order to try to demonstrate my point, I would get into uh, jargony and pedantic uh, type of oh, arguments do for you guys, but we will have a conversation oh, about this. Oh, I, think, yeah. oh. I, I don't want to get jargony, and that's just the word pedantic, right? <laughs> <laughs> Good point, though. though. Very good point. Well, anyways, people can disagree. I do. I don't think there's a problem with too much self-control. And my guess is that what happens is those people have high neuroticism, and they think if they do something that's less self-controlled, something really bad will happen, and it's their worries and their anxiety that takes over. So it's some combinatory effect. That's where I stand. Well, let's not call it self-control, then let's talk about something that I know about, which is conscientiousness. Um, at the high end of that dimension, uh, you, get, you get people who are very high in... They were friends, no. like an hour ago. <laughs> you get people who are very high in orderliness and very high in perfectionism, and that can be kind of rigid, and it can prevent people from actually getting things done. Yeah. And it's, it's true that in general, being high in self-control and conscientiousness is a good thing. But there are some very specific kinds of uh, personality disorder, psychopathology, even diagnoses you can get from the psychiatrist uh, that are related to that. And uh, that's mostly uh, what people refer to as uh, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Right? Uh, and so, yeah, it's not, there aren't a lot of uh, risks to being high in self control, but there is probably that one. I'm, I'm going to be agreeable and say, okay, we'll talk about this later. <laughs> Why? What? Well, now I want to know what you have to say. Oh, I just mean, I maintain my position that this is not In really the face of the evidence. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the evidence is Colin's conjecture. Oh, <laughs> sorry. No, I can't It's for my new show called Science Fights. <laughs> That wasn't a conjecture, that was based on a lot of research. Um, okay. Uh, I have a new paper coming out. I'll show you the papers. I have a new paper coming out, you can read. Oh, do you? <laughs> so do I. <laughs> difference. But I do know that I was when I go I was part of a CDC 
group for anxiety, and one of the main Braggers. things was to uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of the main things was to break yourself of, of of overly obsessive habitual behavior, and that was like what the whole group was scared of, and like like a lot of it was like, hey, just try going out on the weekend once. Or try like not packing carrots every day for the last five years. You know, as psychologists, that is just like that commercial you see on TV. Do you pack carrots? I know. Page two hundred and thirty-seven of the DSM. Pack carrots every day. Well, they say he's packing, packing carrots. So that, that was, no, that was a fantastic. That's a, that's a behavior, you know, and that, that's what right. I heard was like, that's something, like, so, you have to work towards. Agreed, agreed, agreed. But so the way that, from my position, like, that would be following, so the question had to do with, like, when you, um, I think if I can rephrase it, when you're trying to change your behavior and sometimes you go see a behavioral therapist and other kinds of talking therapies, um, and they try to get you to break out of a specific, very routinized, very habitual way of behaving. Um, it's like, no, um, you know, try to go out with friends on the weekend or try to just, you know, deviate from the specific habit that you have, this pattern that you have. And a lot of people are resistant to that when they're in that situation because they are comfortable in this one way of, of being and acting. So from my perspective, the reason that that's not um, an example of how self-control can go wrong, by the way, self-control can definitely go wrong. I just don't think it's very pervasive and I'm, I don't think it's quite the way that Kyle that. and I were, um, <laughs> were talking about. But so in my viewpoint, um, self-control often means overriding what you want to do to do what you think is best for you. And in your situation, or, pe or people of, of people in the situation, we've all been there, there's something that maybe from the outside looks really self-controlled. Shane said earlier, sometimes people actually go to the gym too often, and they get into this very, 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 very narrow pathway of always having to go to the gym, and if they oh. don't go, then they have anxiety. So, see, self-control is about doing what's best for you in the, in the, next, the next period of the long run, and overcoming what feels good in the short run. And sometimes from the outside, that they can look the opposite, but I'm guessing that that's what's going on. It feels comfortable to stick with your routine. Yeah, well, this is going to be boring, because now we agree again. But uh, <laughs> see, I think when people think about self-control, they usually think about uh, suppressing their impulses to do something pleasurable and rewarding. Right. It's like, uh, you know, I want to go and go to this party instead of working. I want to, I want to drink more. I want to, do, you know, I want to goof off. Um, but they tend to ignore the fact that a lot of times we use self-control to uh, avoid acting on our anxieties, right? We, uh, we have this immediate impulse to avoid this thing or not to do this thing or to do this routine like packing carrots that makes us feel comfortable, right? And yet we're like, I don't want these carrots anymore, right? But I need them. Uh, and so you can actually exercise self-control to uh, not follow through on your fears, right? To not give in to your anxiety. So I think that that's a form of self-control too. Well, just curious, and, uh, and, and we're, we're gonna wrap up pretty soon here. We'll take some more questions. But but I, I don't know if I'm, I'm playing uh, just devil's advocate, or I, I, you know, I just like arguing with people a little bit. But, um, but so, so you said self-control is the ability to kind of what was your phrasing? Like defer gratification or something to to. Uh, well, it's more uh, like not giving into what you want to do in order to do what you think is you should be doing or what's best for you. Right, right, right. But no, no one knows what they should be doing. That, that, oh, I, 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 no, that's not true. No, no I, I don't think I don't think that they do. I don't think well, people know. Not with certainty, right? But we do have long-term goals and short-term goals. Uh, right, but right. no, I, I, I mean, I mean, okay. Don't don't smoke cigarettes and exercise, and you know what? Watch, watch what you drink, and and, and, and like, you, you know, you know, sure. But 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 who the fuck knows what's going on in the world, and who knows what choices are are, are best for them, and in what direction that they should go, and and now you're just making excuses. <laughs> no, I understand. I understand. But but isn't there a certain amount of flexibility, uh, mental flexibility that is important in an ever-changing world that is going to have self-driving cars in no time and 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 
and uh, every factory worker. They were talking about keeping factory jobs here in America. No, they're, they're going to be done by robots here in America. It, is, it doesn't matter, you know. So you need to have some so, a certain amount of mental flexibility to not not just be like, I'm on top of my shit, I show up and go to work every day. Well, if you show up and go to work in a job, yeah. that's being eliminated. Right, right, agreed, agreed. Yeah, and here's the way that I would think about that. Uh, if you think that flexibility and self-control are opposites. I don't think that. No, they're okay. not. Because they're not, right? And no, that, I, mean, not. I think what no, you're bringing up really highlights that, right? Yeah. So self-control, I mean, basically, you know, human beings have this unique problem of self-control because we make plans for things that we want to accomplish in weeks, in months, in years, right? No other animal that we right. know of has that kind of planning capacity. Right, so they were great, but it's still like we're new and <laughs> yeah. we're so uh, but so, I mean, so, that, so that's why we get into all kinds of trouble with self control and with impulses because we have all these demands that we make of ourselves to do things over the long run. So we need that ability to hold on to a longer goal and to ignore things that might feel better or be more pleasurable in the immediate. Right. Um, but the need for flexibility is something else, right? Because even if you are so flexible that you can figure out how to uh, you know, deal with the fact that your job was just taken by a robot, uh, whatever new thing that you came up with, then you're gonna still have to make a plan and then hold it that way right, and right. follow it through, right? Yeah. So you need both, right? You need the flexibility to be able to explore and to think of new possibilities, new potential goals, but then you also need the discipline and the self-control to be able to work toward whatever goal you come up with. And these are completely two different, entirely different mechanisms that don't affect yeah. each other. No. no. <laughs> they, well, they seem to be, uh, at the level of personality anyway, somewhat independent. Because you can find people who are really good at exploring new ideas and coming up with things, and they're just terrible at following through on it. Uh, and then you can find other people who are really good at follow through and you set them some really complicated task even if it's going to take like a year to follow through and they will just doggedly work through that thing and never get distracted but they couldn't come up with a new idea or a new way to, to do something to save their lives right that's so what you, i'm saying though right yeah. that, that, that these I'm are saying, like opposite that, like it seems no, but, like no, but i'm something. saying that you can also well okay. oh oh it's so like you weren't done talking i'm sorry 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 i'm never done talking oh okay <laughs> <laughs> I, I cut you off too early it's, yeah uh, right see. so you can find people like that but you can also find people who are really good at pursuing some long-term goal and they're also really good at thinking up the goal that they're following right those are the people that you know, end up being, uh, you know, world, you know, uh, Elon Musk, right? Yeah. It's like, he not only has the ideas, but it's amazing how he figures out how to make them work. Yeah, but like, right. no one's like that right. in, real, in well, real life. And that, I mean, that's in that extreme, like... but actually, uh, if you just look at people's personalities, there's pretty much an equal number of people who are high in openness and smart and can think about new ideas. And and high, and, high and, and, and high and low in conscientiousness, right? Your conscientiousness basically tells you nothing <laughs> about how creative and intelligent and open to new ideas you are. Conscientiousness and openness are uncorrelated. Uncorrelated. Really? Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, that's that's good to know. Um, I, for, you, I think you were next. All right. So maybe this is the wrong question to ask at this time, I guess, but. Um, with everything that you Here, that's just so we can give the listeners what future episodes will sound like. <laughs> uh, so, with everything that you've said so far about uh, past events um, kind of affecting the way that you make decisions, your ability to exercise health control, it sounds like a, a strong argument for determinism. Is that something that you would agree with in, in all of your research, or is that something you'd shy away from? Uh, oh, that's a can of worms. There we go. Uh, no, uh, no, I would not agree with that. And I have, um, I have a, um, a ten-year history of studying free will and determinism, and especially the way that that people think about those concepts and issues. And so um, this is in the realm of a this. huge part of what she does is free will research, well, and this is like a whole other episode. Significant yeah. other part. And there is a branch of philosophy called experimental philosophy, and my work is in that realm. And, and so I've learned a lot about what does determinism mean, and it's like very few philosophers endorse determinism, like it was exceedingly few. And so, um, and, and I've learned a lot. Because they were programmed to not. Oh. <laughs> 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 what you mean by determinism. <laughs> 
Oh, well, that's right. if so you're a physicist, uh, then you're going to embrace determinism in the no. sense that current events are caused by past events. Well, there's too much quantum uh, mechanics. No, there's too much randomness at the quantum level. You yeah. know that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, don't even go there. I'm just saying, like, like that's a question. It's a great question. Um, but no, and actually, you know what it is? Is like, so the way. Oh my God, we're gonna, it's almost like we planned this. The way I think about self control is a little bit like a cheetah. A cheetah. <laughs> I just realized this now because it goes to your question. It's like running for a cheetah. Like, cheetahs are the best that we know organism in terms of like speed on land. But they can only do it for 60 seconds at a time, and then they're totally kaput for a while. And humans are amazingly good at self-control, like, like far better, as Colin was saying, than any other organism or animal that we know. But we're, it's also very difficult, so we can do that 60-second big push, and then we're really depleted. So um, my research may suggest that there's something like deterministic, but no, it's more just like we've developed this capacity out of otherwise very sick, fixed action patterns that, that, that really predict and explain much of the universe, but somehow we have developed more of a, a strategy for overcoming that at times. It's imperfect by far, but it, it's, our, it's our special capacity. Your dog fails the marshmallow test every time. Every time, every time. Yeah. Still goes for that squirrel, runs right into the tree. Yeah. Another way to think about this is that human beings are weird not only in their ability to have self-control, but also and the ability to choose all kinds of weird goals, right? Like you might want to be like the world champion in Minecraft. Well, you know, like a squirrel can't do that, right? Um, <laughs> so, you know, you talk about determinism and you can argue at the philosophical level, but I think what most people are referring to is how much choice people have in pursuing a, 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 just a wide variety of different paths in life. Uh, and human beings are so complex and so unpredictable that we can pursue uh, you know, any number of different paths in life and there's no way that you're going to be able to predict exactly what decision somebody's going to be going to make in many situations. Even if, yeah, sure, like knowing the situation and knowing their personality traits and whatever, you, you're going to be better at chance than at guessing what they're going to do. But human beings are so complex that you're never going to know for certain. And I think that's what a lot of people mean by determinism. Right? You can just kind of get these broad ideas of when, when a person does go towards these goals, if they don't, uh, if they have to make X amount of decisions, they will reliably fatigue. Right, reliably. And it's like it's probable, Colin used the word before, probabilistic. It's like we Oops. say better than, you know, like we're, we're going to be pretty confident in this, but, you know, nothing is a guarantee. All right, that's it. Let me do one or two more. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, is there any evidence out there for like whether or not a uh, psychedelic experience would increase <laughs> increase? There's always one. <laughs> increase someone's openness, or if people who are people who do it are already have that trait. And the reason the reason I bring it up is I often think of like say like a climate change denier politician. Well oftentimes I'll think like if only they like could trip. I, I, I absolutely think it would have So yeah, I'll I'll just rephrase. Um, so So I have I have a show um, about about psychedelics and, and um, so I tend to get a couple psychonauts in the crowd here and, um, and so I, I use a thing in my act which I know is actually a little bit um, toward the clumsy-er-ish side um, but uh, uh, and, and I sell it like this is definitely the uh, uh, results are in and and Colin especially after after seeing the show was that was like the one thing in my pretty accurate show that he had a criticism of, <laughs> uh, which is that, is, that, is that there has been research into that very thing, do psychedelics make people rate higher in openness, and it seems like that uh, in some, some research has claimed that uh, even a single psychedelic uh, experience can make people rate higher in openness um, for at least a year, if not the rest of their lives. So, but he is asking to uh, rephrase 
is if these complete morons that don't believe in climate change, uh, those are his words, uh, <laughs> if there was a way to open them up a little bit to be like more accepting of new ideas, could uh, possibly, should, should we, if we can just dose the water in the White House. <laughs> Oh, or have Russian prostitutes drink Maybe they're you know. they're <laughs> so, so anyway. Yeah. Well, okay, so there's... <laughs> there's two parts of that question. Yeah, the scar, yeah. you, you covered the more fun part, which is if you take the drugs, right. they make you more open. And yeah, there's one, there's at least one Pretty good study, although it was pretty small, but it's a good start, that found that, yeah, people, especially if they had a strong, uh, what they described as a mystical experience, uh, actually did show higher levels of openness, not only immediately, but even a year later. Um, but then you also asked whether people who are higher in openness are likely to do it in the first place, and that's definitely true, right? Yeah. So uh, that's people who are higher in openness are more likely to be interested in trying a wide variety of substances. Right. Yeah, but I was a pretty close-minded dickbag before psychedelics. <laughs> <laughs> uh, openness for dickbagness. Yeah, that's true. That's disagreeable. <laughs> you know, I will also add, though, that um, I went to this meeting. Google had this meeting a couple of years ago. I think they do it on the regular, but they invite scientists. So it was invite only, and I went out there, and there was... I'm like one of the only behavioral scientists there was physicists and material scientists and astronomers. Um, and, and and there was someone there from NYU who was using psychedelics with people um, who have a lot of anxieties at um, end stage cancer. And, and it has, uh, I mean, I don't know. Here we're talking, I think your question was something around the, the span of a year. And we're talking measurable effects, um, significant higher quality of life effects with this very stressful and challenging life circumstances. So um, some of the cutting edge science I think is going that direction. And for regular folks in their everyday lives, I think it could probably have an effect too, but one might imagine it might become especially like um, um, helpful to a person who's dealing with something so challenging. Yeah, and not just physical illness as well, but uh, depression. There's a whole very promising line of research opening up because people are finally government is finally relaxing the regulations to allow scientists to study psychedelics as a therapeutic treatment. Uh, more reasonable world eventually. Yeah. Uh, we'll get we may be taking a couple steps so, back. So. Less, yes, well, less danger, less nonsense. Um, so, um, so anyway, I, I, I really want to wrap, we can take one, one more question, but, but we, we will, um, I'm, I'm going to stick around, and maybe these two can stick around afterwards and answer some more of your questions afterwards. This one first half. Can you guys talk about sex? <laughs> I talk about sex. Once in a while, I get a stoner in my pocket. That's probably a whole other show, though. No, that's oh. a whole other show. One last question. I know. <laughs> How about free will and how about sex? Just for yeah, the last, yeah. you know, last couple of questions. Just sum up the meaning of life. Just zip it up. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's not actually what meaning is that it's actually a thing in your head that makes you think that way, so it will propel, will propel you in an arbitrary direction. So, um, um, uh, so sex just, is easy, that's just evolution. Right? <laughs> you have to have sex or you wouldn't be here. So, so to, to wrap up, what, let's, how about, how about just a, a, a couple quick key things that, that you can find, uh, or that you can, um, that have been tested to where if people, say, want to change certain aspects of their personality that are problematic, and if, thing, if people want to, uh, if people want to help work on self-control a little bit, so you kind of put a bow on this. Wait, you mean this isn't about sex? Because I was going to talk about how extroverts try more sexual positions. Oh, uh, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, it is true, but okay. Uh, <laughs> I am a low-bound introvert. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I 
was like, why would I? I was like, this, why would I? No, I gotta stop. Man. <laughs> Well, yeah. If you have to stop and think about it, then you're an extrovert. Right? Just do it, then you're an extrovert. Fair enough. Yeah, you know. um, so yeah, so I guess the thing that I would say is that uh, there is a lot of really interesting research. Like, so we've been pretty pessimistic about things like New Year's resolutions and there are all kinds of situational and personality reasons why those are going to fail. Uh, but there's also a whole area of research on how setting goals can actually help people to achieve those goals. Um, and there's a whole line of research on uh, what you might call uh, self-authoring or future authoring or just basically writing about uh, what you want to get in life and how you're going to get it uh, that has shown a lot of power in terms of uh, improving people's lives. So if you just have people sit down and take some time to imagine like what their ideal future is going to be like, uh, and then from that sort of try to identify like a list of goals, and then uh, from those reasonably specific and not too many and not too abstract goals, uh, identify you know like what are the potential obstacles, how are you going to do it, uh, and really sit down and work through that and actually write through it because writing is a way of thinking and it's a way of making your thinking more systematic, right? Uh, that when you do that, people tend to be healthier over time, right? So it's not even just about achieving your goals, it's about being less stressed, because you're basically sort of like getting your mind in order. Uh, you follow up with people like a half a year or a year after they've done that, they've had fewer hospital visits, their immune function is better, uh, you do it with uh, college kids, they get better grades overall, uh, it's been done, uh, there's one, uh, some colleagues of mine, there's one business school in the Netherlands where they're doing this for every incoming class, and they've just raised the levels of people's achievement dramatically, like people are showing up for their exams and uh, getting credits, so you can really see the power of having people uh, think about their goals in a concrete way and write about them and try to, try to detail out uh, how they're gonna achieve them. Uh, well, Kyle pretty much covered it, so I guess that's the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in brief, uh, try to reduce the number of unnecessary decisions in your everyday lives. Um, like when I go to a restaurant, I say uh, to the server, not really interested in the chicken, but among anything else, just choose for me and surprise me. Just surprise me. And so, is it, what, what's the delta? You know, what's the difference between you know the fish and then the pasta? Like seriously, like it doesn't matter that much, right? You go out to eat again, live with it. Um, or um, have your partner pick out things for you, right? Like your partner decide on what to do, etc. No, it's great having a trusted advisor to help you. Um, doesn't say exactly like that person's decision making, right? I realize that there's a there's a way to spin this out in a Russian dog kind of manner, but um, the idea is to just sort of recognize that we're making decisions and we're using self control, like on our devices. Like, and I'd like things to do on my phone, and I would like to do it one more time before I have to get back to work. But at some point, you have ten cans better, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that. I don't. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I think. Uh, uh, no, I'm excited about the Ken Ken. So one more thing. So you know, at some point you have to call the question and move on. And and the, the more that you have these kinds of circumstances and recognizing you have impulses, or um, like one of our friends just mentioned that sometimes things that look really healthy from the outside is just you stuck in your rigid way. I think some self-examination <laughs> is important and. Trying to recognize that that you're that you're using a lot of self-control and, and making decisions for things that quite possibly could be completely irrelevant is going to be your first step to um, a healthier and happier life. And I, I think just uh, what what I gather from all this, and I think one of the big important takeaways is uh, just to do mushrooms in a flow tank. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want a hand for coffee. Oh, yeah. oh. Thank you so much for coming to the show. I really much appreciate it, guys. Thank you.